All right, guys, welcome to part eight uh, of the series of videos on orals preparation for chief mate candidates. So mariners who intend to appear for chief mate orals examination um, will benefit from watching this video. The links to the previous seven parts are in the description section below. So please feel free to watch it. Um, as I do in every video, I take up a set of uh, a few questions, uh, different questions every time. And uh, they're a bit different from what you may be preparing for oral examination. The reason I do that is uh, uh, you may have been very familiar with the standard set of questions, but in case you are asked a question that you are not expecting, and if this is one of the questions, you will be prepared to answer them. Uh, some of the questions I also use pictures to explain the point. Uh, however, if you have any issues or in understanding the questions or the answers, please let me know in the comment section below. So let's get started. Uh, today's uh, first question is uh, when recovering your anchor cable, you discover the anchor has caught up in a submarine cable. Uh, what action would you be taking? Now, of course, uh, when you go as a chief mate, uh, they expect you to answer not only like a chief mate, but also like a master because you are pretty much the second in command. They will ask you to assume that you are in command of the ship or the vessel at all times so you have to answer like a person who can take command of a vessel so once uh, you realize that the anchor is fouled by the submarine cable or by the submerged cable uh, it would be imperative to inform the bridge immediately and in no circumstances give indication that the anchor is sighted and clear now this is of course you are the chief officer you are maybe at anchor stations uh, but it is important that you understand the procedure to retrieve or recover the anchor cable in such cases and how would you go about doing that so of course you will have a discussion with the master and in agreement with the master you might feel it is necessary or prudent uh, wise to let the anchor go again with the hope that the fouled anchor cable will dislodge itself with this action so you have although you have kind of fouled it if you let it go if you pay out more cable on the anchor it is a possibility that you might dislodge it itself with the action. However, you must realize that the anchor may not clear itself. And in such circumstances, I will discuss two actions that may be considered by you at the time of the uh, situation. Firstly, you may walk the anchor back to the bottom. So walking the anchor is basically lowering the anchor under power, not letting it go by weight or by gravity. So you break the cable at the next joining shackle on the deck, buoy the anchor cable, so mark the anchor cable where it is and deliberately sacrifice the anchor and a limited amount of the cable. So of course, this is one of the most uh, uh, obvious actions, uh, although it leads to loss of equipment, but it is uh, normally what is done by a prudent master because uh, when you have has fouled your anchor cable with a submerged cable or submerged pipeline or a submarine cable you really don't know what you are dealing with that cable might be uh, carrying uh, thousands and millions of watts of power inside it or it could be uh, uh, something very important or it could be something flammable uh, it could be an oil pipeline you don't know what it is carrying so whenever you face a situation like that the most prudent thing is to let go the anchor not let go the anchor rather the lose the anchor deliberately sacrifice the anchor and this is covered of course by insurance as well but what is important is once you uh, do so uh, do it carefully so that uh, the length of the anchor uh, going out is a uh, minimum uh, which is safe for the ship uh, not that it will be of any use but the the whatever you can salvage is the best and the second thing is you should mark the position where you have let go the anchor so if you have a boy then you should buoy it uh, if you don't have a boy you should note down the absolutely accurate gps position or you may mark that place uh, with uh, some uh, uh, bearings and range markers from uh, prominent landmarks so remember it is anticipated that the cable company will recover the anchor free of charge this is part of the salvage operations the ship would then of course is considered unseaworthy because you don't have two working bow anchors and this situation require the space spare anchor to be secured for the vessel to retain her classification now many ships carry a spare anchor sometimes you don't 
but then unfortunately in this situation you would then have to proceed to the dry dock at the soonest your company will arrange that so you have to let the company officials know so that goes that goes without saying all right so when i talk about procedures like that that goes without saying that you have to inform your dpa your owners your charters your insurers your classification society um, all these parties that are involved your the port authority maybe this has happened near a port you have to inform the port authority the vts uh, all the relevant parties you have to inform them and you have to inform them about the position about the situation in which it happened and as a master and a chief officer you also have to prepare a report and although the anchor is uh, retrieved uh, free of charge by the cable company because uh, why they do that is because they appreciate they respect the fact that your vessel lost a critical equipment in trying to protect the cable conversely if that leads to a damage of the cable or it leads to some kind of complication your company is going to be charged millions of dollars so that's why i said the prudent action is to let go of the anchor cable any master would do that however if the foul anchor can be rectified simply without incurring any damage it may be possible to buy a soft mooring rope about the foul cable or it use a mooring rope to bite around a soft mooring rope about the foul cable walk the anchor chain back to clear the obstruction and then heave the anchor home release the bite of the hope bite of the rope and jettison the cable then all right so in both the cases you have to jettison the cable but sometimes you can do it with minimum damages sometimes you may have to let go a large length of the anchor chain the next question is while tied up alongside working cargo smoke is sighted coming out of the number two hatch of a general cargo vessel so number two hatch when i say number two hatch it must be at the beginning of the length of the vessel right at the beginning of the bow so very close to the bow the cargo watch officer has raised the fire alarm and what would you do as the ship's chief officer so naturally it would be normal practice to muster the fire party and proceed to the scene of the fire so you would treat it like any fire situation however because the fire incident it is in port the members of the crew could well be ashore and this could leave the fire party deficient the chief officer would then be expected to take immediate control of the situation using the manpower and the resources available and his or her orders and actions could expect to include the following once the alarm has been sounded you of course stop all cargo operations aboard the vessel that goes without saying call in the local fire brigade via the port and the harbor control on a very high frequency radio requesting immediate assistance remove all non essential personnel from the ship example stewardos you can also check with the ship's foreman that the workers are all clear that nobody is trapped in the cargo hold or nearby spaces make sure you batten down the cargo hatch which is seemingly on fire that is to cut off any kind of oxygen order the engineers to put water on deck and pressurize the fire main so that you can start boundary cooling on as many sides of the cargo hatch as possible post a chief officer's messenger at the head of the gangway to meet the local fire brigade on arrival make ready a fire envelope or a fire wallet as it is called to include the ship's cargo plan as well as ship's fire arrangement plan if you are carrying dangerous goods you may also include a dangerous goods plan in it have the international shore connection readily available i hope you know what international shore connection is it allows the 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 shore firefighters to connect to the ship's firemen through a standard uh, flange that fits into the ship and the other end fits into the shore cargo hoses instruct the chief engineer to make ready the co2 as well for cargo hold flooding in extreme situations we try to avoid it but if it is the fire is really large and uh, it may not be handled so to quickly extinguish the fire it's a good idea to use the co2 especially if you are in port uh, it's a good idea because it is easily you can then uh, call in the the co2 service people and again recharge the co2 before departing from the port so feel free to use co2 do not try to save it unnecessarily because it is there for your use all right that is the problem uh, because we don't uh, really use the services available to us so don't wait for the fire to become too large or uncontrollable if you think that uh, it is going to, if you anticipate that the fire is becoming larger to prevent any kind of further damage use it immediately so you might feel that uh, you might find out that the initial use of the fire uh, the the co2 bottles may extinguish the fire quickly 
then carry out a, a head count on all ships personnel on board now that should be done before you release any co2 or send anybody when you take a fire muster the first action should be when you sound the alarm you should be mustering and making sure you take a head count and uh, making sure that all personnel whether ship personnel or shore personnel are accounted for so you of course have to account for the ship personnel but you may ask the fire the foreman the dock foreman to account for his personnel and his labor making sure that all are accounted for before you release any kind of co2 into the compartment because safety of life will come first forehand and before any other action is taking and then make sure you make notes of any injuries as they occur if you can find somebody ask them to log the events it's important to log the events for insurance purposes or investigation purposes uh, provided you find somebody who spared like a cadet or somebody ask them to start logging the events with the time uh, because it is a valuable document later on when you start claiming or your company starts claiming for insurance move of the breathing apparatus to the scene together with the firefighters make sure you tend the fire wires fore and aft lift the gangway clear of the jetty place engine room on standby once the shore fire brigade has arrived it would be common practice to agree to the desired method of attacking the fire with the view to of course bring it under control as quickly as possible with minimum damage appropriate entries would be made into the ship's logbook as required and make sure that no emergency scenario can expect to take account of each and every detail because each situation will be governed by a different set of circumstances so the above answer is meant only as a general guide uh, also you have to remember this is a general cargo vessel that we are talking about so say the same situation is thrown at you uh, in a tanker situation or a container or a bulk carrier you may have uh, to add a few other uh, points here as well so of course uh, you may also start off uh, by saying that i will be consulting the ism checklist but just simply saying uh, the ism checklist is not enough you have to include what all is mentioned in the ism checklist uh, it also goes without saying that once all the operations are uh, done you have to keep uh, a fire watch you have to keep a fire patrol maintained to ensure that the fire doesn't reignite only once it has been satisfied that the cargo is out will you resume the cargo operations or rather the fire is out that you, that you resume the cargo operations uh, also goes without saying that you will be informing the relevant owners charters insurers classification society um, uh, and any other parties that you deem uh, need to be notified have to be notified by the master uh, ideally you do it with a report you prepare a report and then notify them uh, but keep them abreast of whatever has happened on the ships that goes all that goes without saying donning of firefighting equipment uh, maintaining minimum uh, the safety requirements making sure everybody is donned in the right safety gear all that goes without saying the next question here is after striking a floating object your vessel sustains damage on the water line and a loss in watertight integrity is observed the master lists the vessel over and orders you to establish a collision patch over the damaged area how would you do this now this is answer is not easy this is a very theoretical answer for me to give you i'll show you a couple of pictures as well but in practice this requires some knowledge not some but but good knowledge of seamanship so if you are lucky you will have uh, people with good knowledge of seamanship especially if you are a newly appointed chief officer maybe you have not experienced this before otherwise use the experience of the crew who are there who may have done this job because this is kind of a tricky uh, seamanship uh, uh, practice to follow if you have not done it before or especially because the vessel is listed and it's a tricky situation to put that uh, collision patch so let's get started with the answer so assuming that your vessel is not equipped with designated damage control materials the chief officer would be expected to improvise to establish a patch and that is why i said it's a bit tricky so you have to make sure you are using or you are doing it correctly now this could be carried out by various means and i'll show you a couple of means uh, in the next slides with pictures so you can bolt steel bottom plates together uh, which you can obtain from the engine room and staple a rope pudding around the perimeter of the joint plate all right that's what i've tried to show you in the picture here you can see the steel bottom plate with the rope uh, putting around it uh, also the side view of how it looks then drill the center of the plates to accommodate a shackle and drill the upper edge to fit suspension shackles so then it is suspended in a way that it acts like a collision mat it acts like a mat that prevents any kind of flooding into the compartment you can also cover the outer surface and inner edge with canvas all right uh, canvas is easily available on the vessel or you can use the 
canvas covers often available for mooring ropes or something like that. Try to use thick canvas covers. Lower the patch over the gunwale on suspension wires to cover the damaged area of the hull. Now that is the tricky part what I was talking about is if you try to uh, get the cover lowered onto a hole, it is a tricky part, especially with the ship listing and ships do not stay still. Uh, ships, uh, depending on the sea situation, of course, uh, they kind of always there is a movement there. So it's a bit tricky whether you have the available cranes or uh, equipment available to lower it. Sometimes you have to lower it manually and that is where the tricky part comes in. Uh, brace the patch in by means of a windlass from the opposing side of the hold if the cargo load permits. All right, so there are these a couple of ways that you can do it. Uh, you can pull the steel plates that is ideal, but if the steel plates become too heavy, you do not have the equipment, then you may have to use canvas or thick canvases. Burlaps, sometimes burlap sacks are used, uh, covered with, uh, they, are, they are filled up with uh, absorbent material and load. It's just a patch. It's just a temporary patch to prevent any kind of flooding. Uh, although it's, it's, it's difficult to prevent uh, flooding, uh, some water will seep in, but it reduces the rate of flooding and you keep on pumping out the water till the time you reach the uh, port or you reach the dry dock where they will carry out the necessary repairs. So these are this is just temporary arrangements, just a patch, patch up job, uh, not permanent arrangements, of course. Uh, the last question here is, or no, maybe the second last question here today is that while holding the anchor watch aboard your vessel, you see another vessel approaching at a fast speed and closing range. What action would you anticipate taking, especially if the master is not on board and if the approaching vessel was at a two mile range? Now, this two mile range is uh, very less. Uh, however, you might feel it is less, but when uh, your vessel is at anchor and another vessel is approaching it, you have to remember that they are also approaching it at the slowest speed. They will not be approaching it full, full speed at sea, just like at sea. So at, like, at sea, if both vessels are approaching at full speed, two miles is of course a very less distance. But at Anchorage, uh, you get some sort of time because they are also approaching at a slow speed. And also when they know they are approaching very close to you, they may have put the vessel on uh, a stern engines or a stern movement, which may have slowed the momentum. But you have to assume that they are on kind of a collision course or collision uh, path uh, to your vessel, although they are slowing down. So you would monitor the vessel closely and sound five or more short and rapid blast on your ship's vessel. If the vessel does not take immediate action to alter her course away from your position, you would order dead slow ahead on the ship's engine and steam over your own ship's anchor cable, but slowly. Now, I, I have discussed this uh, once in the class and some of the students uh, frowned on it and they said, uh, but uh, you know, how can you use uh, ship's engines? Remember when you are at anchorage uh, as a master or chief officer, you always have to remember that you must ask the engine room to keep your ship's engines at short notice at five minutes or 10 minutes notice. And this is especially uh, in areas where there is a lot of traffic coming in or some dodgy areas where you, you are not really sure about the quality of the seabed the vessel uh, the anchor is holding it to so you have to always keep your engines to at short notice so vessel engineers should be able to prepare the engines at short notice and that is why it allows you to give a dead slow movement and slowly just steam over your own ship's anchor cable the whole idea behind it is to take the vessel out of the line of approach and avoid the potential collision scenario so just get out of the collision path you do your side as well. So your, your vessel gets out of the collision path and so does the other vessel start to take action as well. If you, they don't, even then you are a bit out of the collision path. So that's the whole idea behind it. You don't have to go five or 10 miles away. You just have to get out of the collision path. So when at anchor, the ship's engines are left on stop or at short notice and as such should be readily available for an immediate order. Alternative actions are available in the situation where you can pay out the anchor cable and let the vessel drop back astern this is also uh, practiced very commonly. You have to ask somebody to rush to the anchor station, pay it out. When you pay it out, the vessel sometimes just go back, goes back astern and you get out of the collision path as well. Even if the other vessel may damage your anchor cable, at least it doesn't damage your vessel. So the damage is left minimum. You may also heave in on the anchor cable and pull the vessel ahead. So paying it out would take you astern and uh, pulling it or heaving it in would take the vessel ahead. Or you can go hard over with the rudder and give the vessel a kind of a shear, a, just a shear enough to just get out of the way. So these alternatives will take up, a, of course, valuable time to execute and closing range of the target vessel may not permit the use of these options. So you have to remember that. 
Following a minor collision, a ship is proceeding towards a port of refuge when it is realized that the fore end of the vessel is flooding and that the collision bulkhead is in danger of collapse. What actions would you take if you had no means or materials to shore up the collision bulkhead? As we discussed in the earlier question, what would you do? Highlight any hazards that may be associated with your solution. So now you don't have anything, uh, any means or materials. You are not carrying any means or materials to shore up the collision bulkhead to prevent the flooding. What would you do? So few modern merchant ships these days carry sufficient damage control equipment to be capable of shoring up a bulkhead. And I think I agree with that statement because uh, uh, none of my ships did except for these burlap sacks or uh, mattresses and uh, mats. Uh, even if employing uh, an improvised equipment like derricks or crane jibs, uh, neither is the manpower to handle such items usually readily available. And that's again a statement I agree with because like I told you in my previous uh, answer as well, when I was explaining how to shore up a collision mat, I told you it's a tricky task. It's not an easy task. In theory, it sounds very good. You can say it to the surveyor, you can answer it to the surveyor, but in practice, it is a very tricky task. It is not that easily uh, done. Uh, I have had an experience and that's why I'm telling you sometimes the crane, even with the ship's crane, the crane may not be able to reach the required spot or it becomes very tricky to even handle the ship's crane wire. It's a heavy thing. It's not easy to handle uh, a crane um, so or, or steel plates or bolt them, uh, weld them, especially when the ship is listed or it's such a tricky part. It's not that easy, but in theory, you have to give these answers uh, in the orals examination. So if flooding is a feature on one side of the bulkhead, it may be prudent to deliberately partially flood the next compartment aft. Now, this would have the effect of putting an opposing pressure on the bulkhead and prevents the possible bulkhead collapsing. So what you do is if only one side of the bulkhead is starting to press up with the water, what happens is there's, it exerts a too much pressure on the bulkhead from one side and exerting that kind of pressure can lead to the bulkhead uh, buckling under that pressure and uh, progressive flooding. But what, what if you can flood up the other side of the bulkhead with the equal amount of water and if you flood it up to full and the other side is full as well, what happens is the pressure is then equalized on both sides of the bulkhead and that helps the bulkhead to sustain the pressure. So pressure becomes equalized. Such action will however increase any free surface movements that will also affect your ship's positive stability. Therefore, such action should be simultaneously accompanied by an improvement to the GM by pressing up the lower and the double bottom ballast tanks. All right. So, of course, when you start filling up the water, you may shift the center of gravity towards the ship's meta center. Uh, it may go upwards, reducing the GM or the G may go above the meta center and become a negative GM, in which case you may have some issues with your stability or positive stability. And that is why once you start filling up, up remember to uh, bring your G down or center of gravity down at the same time by pressing up the lower bottle, bottom tanks. So when you press up the lower bottom tanks, you are asking the center of gravity or you're prompting the center of gravity to shift downwards at the same time as well. So the center of gravity will be below the meta center and your GM will be positive and you may have some residual GM uh, to counteract for any kind of list if you develop any. Although when you start filling up the four peak tank, uh, it's the fourth end of the vessel, you will have issues with trim. Uh, not so much will list but you will have issues with trim and that you can control by filling up the aft tanks as well. If you have any lower aft peak tanks, that will be fantastic. So I hope uh, these questions are a bit interesting, bit different from what you have been preparing for. Like I said, you may not be asked these questions, but in case you are, then it will help you to prepare to answer. At least even if you give a bit of a theoretical answer, even if you answer a little bit to the surveyor, the surveyor may be impressed by the fact that you have prepared for these different kind of questions.